So, welcome everybody. Uh, our last speaker of this morning is going to be Flavia Missi, who is going to talk about TDD, Python, and Django. Give her uh, an applause, please. Hi, uh, as he just said, I'm going to talk about test driven development with Python and Django. Um, a little presentation first. Uh, I'm Flavia, I'm from Brazil. Uh, this is my first week in Sweden. I just got here on Saturday and this is my first presentation in English too, so if you guys don't understand what I say, just interrupt me that I will try to speak clearer. Um, this is where I worked before coming from Brazil, Global.com. It's, it's a major uh, media company and Global.com is actually the web branch of it. Um, and working there, I started to develop a platform as a service. It's called Sudo. And you guys can look up on the internet. I, the, the site is sudo.io. And I worked about four years on, on Global.com. Most of the, those years, I was developing Sudo. Uh, I've, I'm seeing some weird faces. Are you guys understanding? All right. OK. <laughs> and now I'm proudly. Uh, a team member of funded by me. Uh, I started working remote by them, for them, and now I'm actually here. Um, so let's talk about a little about the agenda. Uh, I plan to start going very quickly about good and bad code, and it's a quick definition actually, just so we have the same things in mind, and then I'm gonna try to explain to you what actually TDD is and what's the difference between testing and doing test-driven development. And then I'm going to try to convince you why to use TDD. And after, we're going to see a little of how to actually apply the TDD techniques, techniques on our day-to-day -day development process. And after that, but we're going to talk a little, very little, very fast about continuous integration. So let's start with good code and bad code. Um, I bet everyone here has a definition in mind of what good code and bad code is. And I bet that all definitions you have in mind are actually right. Um, this is actually a picture I like a lot. Uh, the real measurement of good or bad code are what the fox per minute. So if you hear a lot of what the fox, it means the code is bad. A little what the fox means the code is good. And <laughs> I actually like to think of code uh, like a living thing. So you guys heard that code smells, right? We all know that code smells. But I've been asking myself why code smells, actually. And I think it is because it is a living thing. And when it smells bad, it's because it's rotting or dying or something like that. So kind of <laughs> this is how. I see why code smells, and this guy, or girl, or whatever, and it's gonna bite you on production, uh, because when you don't treat the code as a living thing, it's gonna rot and die, and it's you, you're gonna have bugs, and the bugs are gonna appear on your production as usual, so uh, this is what we try to avoid with TDD. So actually, let's dive in in what TDD is. Uh, it's actually a set of processes. It's not only like one thing that you have to do to get it right. Um, it, and it comes from extreme programming. Here's a little bit of the practices that extreme programming uses. And TDD is right on the middle of it. So for me, it's like the core of uh, extreme programming. If you don't do TDD, you're not even starting to do extreme programming. So there is another part of TDD that I didn't tell you. Um, TDD is actually, it actually means to, to write the test before you write any production code. So there are different ways of testing and not every, not every way you test you're doing TDD. 
So if you don't write your test first, you're not doing TDDs. The first step to do TDDs to actually do not write any production code um, without having a test that is failing. I'm gonna go a little more deeper we'll on this later. So now I'm actually gonna try to convince you to why to use TDD. Um, any of you guys uh, write tests or run tests on a daily basis? Just hands up. Whoa, everyone. And <laughs> good, good. And how many of you write tests first, as in TDD? <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, <laughs> good, good. You're on the right track. All right. Um, so. Most of us, most of us, write tests for functionality assurance, right? It's so things don't break on production, correct? And so we want to avoid that things go very, very wrong on production. That's why we write tests. But TDD is not just about it. Uh, some say, uh, if you guys read about, like some 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 famous phrases of Uncle Bob Martin, and you guys heard of him, and he actually says that TDD is not at all about uh, reliability or functionality assurance. So what is TDD about if it's, if it's not about avoiding uh, breaks or outage or, or bugs and that stuff? TDD is actually about testing for design. It's actually the name is test-driven development. Some say that a better name for it would, would be test-driven test -driven design. Uh, I agree, a better name for it is test-driven design, but um, but the name is not actually it, so test-driven <laughs> development. And But how we do that, how, we, how we, we go into a point, into a place that the tests are actually uh, driving the design of a whole application, if you think of it, you might, you might think that it's kind of, of simplistic, that it's impossible that the tests are going to are going to actually end up making you you make the right decisions about the design, but it's actually possible, and there's a lot of resources online about this. Um, but we should be careful, uh, because sometimes letting the test drive our development process can lead to traps, and this is actually a hipster trap. I didn't find a better trap, so let's pretend it's a developer trap. <laughs> Maybe some beers there. And what we have to look out when we are we are starting to to test first and leave the process of designing to the tests. Uh, the main thing that I I am concerned while while writing tests first is to under under engineering, because it's really easy to under engineer while testing first. Because for TDD we try to to break the functionality in real like small units to so we are able to test it to unit unit test it uh, in a proper way so when when breaking the functionality in smaller units you can end up with less than you need and to avoid this I'm actually you you we are we try to actually look a little forward but not too forward because you can over engineer if you look like too much in the future and not much in the present. So it's not that you should forget about the future, the future, but you should think about it and you should be careful to not under under engineer anything. Uh, good principles to have in mind are keep it simple and you are not gonna need it. It's Kiss and Yagn. Um, so here again. Nobody knows what this picture means, right? I was trying to show you that code, again, is a living thing, is a living organism, and you should treat it like a pet, but not too much like a pet, because not that many love. And yeah, that, that's basically it. So actually, now we're going to go into how to TDD. So I've talked a bit of the process of it, like right before in the pre right previously on the presentation, but I didn't go too deep in the TDD process or how to do it. Um, hopefully I convinced you to test first, and if not, you can find me on the corridor or after the, the talk, you can ask questions. 
And this is actually the, the main TDD process. You guys have seen this image a lot, I, I think. Everybody shows it in the first TDD, uh, the first contact with TDD. And this is actually the base of it, but it's not everything. Uh, you start with a failing test, that is the red, and then you write only enough code so that failing test passes. And then after the, the test passes, you're going to try to refactor it. Um, sometimes you're, you're going to skip the refactory part because you don't have enough code to refactor or whatever reason. But it's always good to, to at least search for things to improve and refactor and maybe actually do a design refactor. And so this is the basic, the basis of the, the TDD process. Um, Uncle Bob Martin wrote a set of rules. It, it's actually three rules for a success TDD approach. And one of them, I can't read it from here. Uh, you are not allowed to write any production code unless it's to make a failing test pass. What that means, means exactly this. You can't write any code without the, having a test that is breaking. You just write enough code to the test pass. It's actually the red-green refactor, but it's really hardcore. I mean, I don't do this um, every time. I mean, there are times that I don't test, actually, and there are times that I test after because I'm not sure of what I'm doing, but we should always we should always try to to actually test first because because by testing first you you make the interface clearer you are actually using your code before you have written you have written it so what the need of the functionality or of something you are you are coding it's it's clearer when you write the test first i mean it's going to be it's going to be clearer in a few slides uh, the third principle is you are not allowed to write any more production code than is sufficient to pass. I already said this one. So, yeah, testing also smells. So, not every test code is good test code. So, you, we can test uh, like in a whatever manner and we can do bad testing code. And how do we find out if our test is good or bad? So. I have this basic principle that I apply when I'm not lazy <laughs> and it, it works like that. You write a test and when you are going to implement the, f the, the functionality to make the test pass, uh, if the functionality is too hard to implement or if you have to write a lot of code to make one single test pass, you are doing it wrong because it should be easy. That's why we break it when we are doing TDD. We break every functionality into the, the smallest piece of code we can actually do. And so if you are, if you are struggling, either your tests are wrong or your approach to, the f to fix the test is wrong. But mostly the tests are wrong. Um, I've seen a lot of people struggling to write tests or struggling to implement a functionality to make the test pass, and the solution is always rethink everything. You're probably looking at it in a wrong way, or you didn't understand the problem right, but first of all, try to break the problem again, because if there's too much functionality for the test to pass, or is something is too hard, you should break it again. This is a short example. It, it's not the best example to, to a testing approach, but it's short enough, so I can tell you in this short time. Uh, this is a f uh, view test in Django. It's actually using the client, but if you want to do uh, a more like unit test, this, this is more like a functional test. If you want to do like a more unit test, you could instead of using the client, you could use the request factory from, from Django. How many of you have used request factory? Cool. Um, it's simpler, and if you have a, a lot of uh, middlewares or authentication that is kind of complex, it's, it's very simpler to use the request factory instead of the client. So here, um, what I want is, my need, is I want to implement a view that lists posts. 
just that. And the first thing that I need is actually a web page, blank web page, that, is, that it, it works. So I start to testing it. And I try to get it, this URL. You could use reverse too. And I assert that the, the status code is going to be a 200 status code. So it's as simple as it gets. Unless you're using request factory, then it can be simpler. And to make it pass, I just need to add the URL in the urls.py and implement a view. And if you're using class-based views, you don't need to do anything else. And it's going to work with a list view. And the, the, the next step when you get the, the 200 stats code is to actually test that you have the posts variable on the context or wherever the name it is, like objects or something. And in here, I just test that it is on the context. I'm not testing it actually the value of it uh, because I'm trying to break each test to test the smallest amount of functionality possible because in this way I can see exactly what is failing if something fails, when something fails or two years later when I'm refactoring this, I'm going to know exactly what piece of code is breaking. Um, so the next step, uh, sorry, to make that pass, I just have to add a variable in the context. It doesn't have to, to it doesn't need to have any values on it. It can be just none. And the next step is to actually assert that the post variable has the expected value. And I do that with, I do that with assert query set equal. How many of you guys have used assert query set equal? Not many, cool. Um, so it, it actually keeps the order. So if I had a different order of posts, uh, I'm assuming that P1, P2, and P3, and P4 are ordered by chronological, chronologically, just like in my test name. And at first, it will break because I don't have anything in my posts uh, context variable. It's going to be none, probably, whatever. And, and then to make it pass, I'm going to do a query, or I'm going to set the, the query set on the Django class-based view, rewrite the query set, so I can actually order it in a chronological manner. And so, as you've seen, uh, every test is like a little bit of test, and to make it pass, it, it just needs a little bit of code too. So, smallest test with the smallest pieces of code to make it pass. This is, this is what TDD is about. Um, if you don't do this, you're going to end up with big, te big tests and your tests are, gonna, are not going to be very clear when they fail. Uh, because when they fail, you're, you're going to be, be doing a lot of tests on a test method and you're going like to like to have to search where is the failure on the test method. So it's just better if we, if we break everything into smaller chunks. Uh, and so uh, just one test fails when that single functionality actually fails. Um, all right. Here are some tools. Uh, unit test is the best tool always, but Django test test case is actually pretty good. But you should take like care with it because you should be careful with it because it it wraps up each test method with a transaction. So for each test method the database is clean. So it's actually kind of dangerous because it can be very slow. Mainly if you are in a slow machine like this one. Um, I like nose too. Actually, let me talk more about Django test. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of other, um, a lot, a lot of other helper methods on Django test package. And you should see in the documentation, they have a whole page with uh, a lot of assertions, assertion, assertions. And nose, so nose has a has a lot of assertions too that I don't use them. Um, I rather use the unit test assertions, but it has cool plugins to filter tests, and it has also a test runner and pytest. Uh, I haven't used pytest a lot actually, but I have seen the output and it's like a green and red and it's kind of pretty, so it's a good tool. 
So now let's just go really quickly about continuous integration. Do I have time? All right. Um, so if you don't, if you test, it doesn't matter with TDD or without TDD. If you test, you need to have continuous integration because you have to run all your tests at once and integrate it with other brands and everything else. And you need to see what the result of the integration is actually. So if you don't have like a dashboard with failing tests and passing tests, um, it's not going to be visible. Your tests are not going to be visible. You need, you need visibility when you do tests because you need to be notified when your test breaks uh, or else it's going to be a mess. Um, oh, there's, a, um, there's an, an example I did in Funded by Me. The test took, we use Circle CI, and the test took like 30 minutes to run. And Circle CI has a distributed to, to, it adds containers, so you can distribute the test running between the containers. And I changed the, the, the framework we use to run tests to use nodes. And this way you could filter the tests better and distribute between the containers better. And I was able to, to reduce the time to 16 minutes, from 30 minutes to 16 minutes. 16 minutes is actually quite slow, but we have a lot of uh, behavior-driven tests, behavior tests, behavioral tests with selenium, and they are slow by nature. But by splitting them and running them uh, in parallel, we can actually make things go real fast. Um, so this is like some some continuous integration tools that are open and free. I use it Jenkins too. It's a, it's a very good tool. Okay. And that's my first Swedish word, <laughs> <laughs> Swedish phrase actually. Um, that's all I have to say to you guys now. Questions? There. Hello. Um, I was considering when you're working on already existing code and trying to refactor it or adding functionality, and it's uh, very hard to capture the output of a function, what uh, are a good way to to use tests or test driven development when you're when you're developing in an existing code base yeah. that doesn't have any tests uh, they might have tests but uh, for example you need to change something in a very large function that just mutates some object yeah um yeah i have experience with that what i usually do is uh, kind of ignore everything that it has already about testing and just write a test to the functionality i do uh, you can use mocks for that, and um, Python mocks library is pretty good. And I try to like isolate everything that else it's doing and test just like the bit of functionality I'm adding. If you have time, it would be great if you could do a refactor. But if you don't, you can use a mock or you can like work around and t t test exactly what you need to. Hi. Uh, <laughs> hi. <laughs> Can you explain more about uh, the design? Uh, at what point the design comes to the test-driven development you are doing? Yeah, right. At what point the design comes? It actually, it, it's not a, a very clear at what point the design will appear. It's not like magic. Uh, oh, I've written 15 tests and now I have a design. It's not like that. And it's you're actually ha trying to achieve a simple design with TDD and a simple and devolutive design. So when you start, you are not going to have any design because you are start s you're starting simple and small. So you're probably not going to need a very handful of design code and layers and patterns or anything like that. But um, when your code starts to evolve on your platform, when your, your software starts to evolve and it starts to get more complex and this is where TDD uh, actually appears to be the best tool to use because uh, when you use the process right, 
you will end up with a very simple design and a very easy to evolve design. There is actually a very good book. Um, I don't remember the author, but the name is Refactoring to Patterns. Y you guys should take a look of it, uh, at it. And it says exactly this. And it's not actually where the design comes, but it's actually uh, how to, to get a, like an existing base code with tests, uh, code base <laughs> with tests, and how to to evolve what you have to patterns. So it's actually kind of the same you were you were asking me because you don't design in f upfront. You design like on the way. It's on the fly. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Hi. Uh, so can you recommend any? It's not working. Hello. Okay. So can you recommend any tools for front-end web testing? For example, when you render a web page with Django, but you have some JavaScript on the page, for example, Ajax. You want to test, test only the JavaScript, or you want to test like an integrated environment? I guess the integrated environment. The integrated environment. So there is a Splinter that I, I, s I talked about on the earlier talk. Splinter is a, a like a capybara for Python, and it has a lot of web drive of, of supported drivers and it's extensible, so if there's a new tool that you want to use, uh, you can just write a new driver. There's a clear interface to implement. And I think that behavior-driven behavior, behavior -driven tests uh, are best to, to test, like rendering the interface and how, how the, the interface, uh, like widgets and, and things, interact with your backend. I think the best, the best tools are, are the behavioral tools like Selenium and Phantom JS, which is a headless tool. But it, it's not easy to work on Ubuntu, Phantom JS. Um, also, uh, Selenium WebDriver, I think, that has a, a headless browser. But I'm not sure if, if it renders uh, JavaScript. There was someone. So uh, how do you organize your code in uh, respect to directories? And also, how do you organize it when you are uh, uh, committing, uh, committing to the Git, to your, to your uh, code repository? How do I organize when I'm committing? How do you organize your code in respect to the code you're actually testing uh, in sub packages or in yeah, stuff like that? There are or actually some options. Uh, one option is what Django does. Uh, Django, the source code of Django, not the apps. And it puts everything in one test directory and it subdivides just the like the app. Like there is the Django directory and there is the test directory and inside them there are kind of the same directories. So but I actually do inside of the apps. I have a tests directory instead of the tests.py. And there I, I divide like whatever I like to do, like unit tests, functional tests, uh, behavioral tests, or what is the name? A acceptance tests mm -hmm. and integration or whatever you want to do. And usually that's how I do. I, I, I have the Django apps, and inside each app, I have the tests for it. And in the commit phase, I usually commit the test together with the, the production code. So that brings the question that um, if you're going to do a pre-commit uh, hook on that one, are you going to be working with uh, your local <coughs> test then? You cannot do commits on, on, uh, on foreign servers, really. What do you mean by that? Uh, if you have a staging, s if you have a staging test phase right. before you can commit, then it's kind of uh, in a you deadlock. run on stage. You run the test directly on stage, not locally. Is that what you mean? Yeah, exactly. If you have that, uh, if you have that um, requisite to be able to commit, then you need to t add the tests first in a commit before, so you can actually stage it and then. Yeah, the answer commit. for that is quite more complicated mm -hmm. because I don't like. Uh, running acceptance tests, all acceptance tests before merging on stage. Um, you can you can run it on every commit on a a web server like uh, Travis CI or or Circle CI and things like that on each branch before merging on the on the stage branch or something like that. And 
but testing first, it doesn't mean to test like acceptance first. I'm, I'm talking mostly about unit tests. I actually do functional testing first too, because uh, currently I'm not splitting before, but I'm not splitting uh, unit and functional tests, although I like it. Uh, but I do functional tests first. Um, and this is the only kind of test that I do first. You, you have to choose a, a, a test to do first, and it's the simplest one that you ha that you want to test first, and uh, because you actually want to run every all the tests on your platform too before you want to commit. But every unit test or every functional test, not the the acceptance that are very slow. Uh, speaking of uh, slow acceptance or integration tests, uh, these often test multiple pieces of code at the same time. Do you usually structure the code at that these tests will perform each of these tests, or do you separate the test and uh, for clarity and uh, test them multiple times, so to say? I'm not sure I understand your question. Uh, you're asking how how do I organize my 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 acceptance code? So say that you have a test that tests, for example, A, B, and C. Yeah. Or ra rather you have a functionality that uh, performs A, B, and C. Would you write three different tests for each of these uh, functionalities that depend, sh depend on each other? Or would you it combine depends. them? It depends. Actually, the, the question you want to your ask yourself is uh, how clear are those tests going to be when they fail? So if, if the failure is not clear, uh, you probably should split them. But uh, if the place where the failure is, is clear on the test, it, it's, it's enough. It's the, the piece is enough. All right. Cool. Um, about unit testing in Django with database, do you actually connect to the database or you use uh, mock objects? I actually connect to the database. As I said, I'm actually doing more functional tests than unit tests. Um, so functional tests, by, by definition, kind of, they connect to the database. And that's quite uh, slow, at least for me, in my, my not very powerful machine. And I actually started to writing a kind of a test framework that overwrites uh, the Django's the full cast test case to actually do a trun truncate, truncate on the database. So it it cleans everything on the setup class, not on the setup. You guys know the difference, right? So, uh, 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 in the setup class and in the teardown class. So I'm actually I actually do the, the I organize the tests in a kind of different way. Uh, there is a project on my GitHub. It's called Django Extreme TDD. It's not it's not over yet. It's very alpha, and if you guys want to contribute, we are very you are very welcome. And but the database is actually a pain in the ass to 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 get over with because it's slow. You also might want to use a, a SQL SQLite three SQL Lite three, the 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 simple database on your development machine. But it's important that you on your continuous integration tool you use your actual that database because you can have uh, different behaviors and this kind of things. I think that's all. <laughs> <laughs>